Hi everyone, welcome to EC1210 Macroeconomics. My name is Paul Tilley, and today we're looking at Unit 8, the money market and monetary policy in Canada. Now, if you look at this, Unit 8 is really covered in Chapter 9 of the textbook, and Unit 8 has a lot of material within the content module, so please take a look at that. Today, we're going to look at this in terms of some key learning objectives. We're going to describe the functions of the Bank of Canada. We're going to differentiate between transactions demand for money and asset demand for money. We're going to explain how the money supply and the demand for money interact to determine the equilibrium income rate. And we're going to discuss the impact of monetary policy on real GDP and inflation. First, let's take a look at the functions of the Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada is Canada's central bank. It's owned by the federal government and it is an operation that is independent of the federal government. The directors and governors are appointed by the federal cabinet. Currently, the governor of the Bank of Canada is Tiff Macklin. He's been in the news quite a bit. The current situation coming out of COVID, we see the economy is kind of fragile, yet prices are rising. And what do the bank do when prices rise? Well, they tend to increase the interest rate. And so interest rates have risen to about 4.5% as of March 2023, which is relatively high compared to the level of 0.5% or 0.75% that was much earlier. So we can see a dramatic increase in interest rates. The purpose of that is to slow down the economy because, you know, if you have to borrow money, it suddenly become more expensive, so you're less likely to borrow. And if you're saving money, the interest rates have gone up a bit, which encourages you to save money. There are several functions of the Bank of Canada. First of all, it's responsible for Canada's currency. It's the sole issue of currency. It's also the government's bank. So when the government needs to pay bills or when the government needs money to do a particular project, the Bank of Canada is who it goes to. It's also the banker's bank, meaning that the large privately owned banks, such as the Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia, will go to the Bank of Canada for money or they will look to the Bank of Canada in terms of setting interest rates, and that will be the rates that they'll be charged when they borrow money from the Bank of Canada. It's also the auditor and inspector of the commercial bank, so it manages the viability, safety, and trust of the commercial banks. And it also serves to regulate the money supply. And as I say, you know, in high interest rates, it tends to regulate the money supply because it keeps the amount of money flowing down. In terms of the supply of money, the interest rate is directly connected with that. And the interest rate is nothing more than the cost to rent money. And it is strictly an annual rate. It's stated as an annual rate, say 5% or 4.5%, at which payment is made for the use of these money. So, for example, it is an amount, 4.5% would be $4.50 per hundred, would be the charge for that money per year. If we look at this in terms of a graphical sense, the supply of money is really determined by the Bank of Canada. They'll print money or they'll pull money out of the circulation. Next, we're going to take a look at the transactions demand for money versus the asset demand for money. There are really two types of demand for money. The first is what we call the transactions demand for money. And it is just the money that is required in order to buy and sell things. Okay, And if we think about it, People hold money, people spend money, and people make money. And that's really what the transactions demand is. It is really dealing with that flow. And it's not related to interest rates. In fact, demand is based on the level of real gross domestic product and prices. The second types of demand for money, something called the asset demand for money. And that's really the desire to use the money as a store of wealth, that is, to hold value as an asset. And it is strictly inversely related to interest rates. As interest rates go up, for example, the spending power of money drops. So if we look at this graphically, we can see that regardless of the interest rate, the market demand for money is very much set. Whereas the asset demand for money is absolutely dependent on the interest rate. And we see, for example, that like any other product, that as price of money goes up, interest rate for example, the demand for money will drop. 
So the total demand for money is a combination of the two. So it's the, the market demand and the transactional demand. And we can see that this is related in this diagram. So in summary, the demand for money is determined by the level of transactions, real GDP, the average value of the transactions, the price level, and finally, the rate of interest. So next, let's explain how money and the money supply and the demand for money interact to reach some form of equilibrium that would define the interest rate. Using the market supply and the market demand for money, you can notice that the market supply is set by the Bank of Canada. It's a vertical line. The market demand is very much contingent on the interest rate. The higher interest rate would indicate less demand or would generate less demand, and a lower interest rate would create more demand. The intersection of the supply and demand line will define the interest rate, or R1, in this graphic. Okay, So there will be no shortage or no surplus in R1 because it is the interaction point. If, for example, the rate was above R1, meaning that the equilibrium rate was less than the market rate, you would have a surplus of money. What does that mean? Well, interest rates are so high, people don't want it at that price. They're not willing. So you'd have an excess supply of money, hence a surplus. The opposite would also be true. If interest rates fall below the equilibrium rate, everybody will clamor off and look for low interest loans and the like. This will create a shortage of funds. And as a result, it will effectively drive prices up towards the equilibrium. So at the equilibrium interest rate, R1, there's no surplus or no shortage of money. However, at any rate other than that rate, there will either be a shortage, a shortage would occur if the, the, the market rate is lower, or a surplus, which would occur if the market rate is higher. So you may ask, well, how does the market adjust really then to move interest rates up or down accordingly? Well. Money markets adjust to the surplus or shortage for what's called bond yields. And bonds are effectively instruments that are sold on the market. And these bonds are really short-term loan. Uh, they're issued by corporations, banks, and various levels of government. They have a set face value. The payment of interest on them is fixed, it's called the coupon rate, and they can be bought and sold on the market. Depending on what people want for it, it will sell for less in the secondary market, it will sell for less or more. So bond prices adjust to reflect the return on the financial instruments with similar risk. In other words, they automatically adjust. So the higher the price, the lower the return. So in our particular situation here then, when we think about, well, where do interest rates get set? People tend to, in times of surplus of money, people tend to buy bonds. In times of shortage of money, People tend to sell bonds, so really it's a function of demand for bonds. If there's a surplus of money, people can choose to buy bonds to reduce their liquidity and earn income. And bond prices will rise, leading to a fall in bond yields and interest rates. Rates will fall until there's no more surplus. If there's a shortage of money, people will sell bonds in order to increase their liquidity, and the bond prices will fall in this case, leading to an increase in the bond yields and, correspondingly, interest rates. And rate increases until there's no more shortage. So it will naturally seek equilibrium. Increase in interest rate is caused by a rise in demand for money and a fall in supply of money. Decreases in interest rate is really caused by a fall in demand for money and a rise in supply of money. Next, we're going to discuss the impact of monetary policy on real GDP and inflation. Well, monetary policy really consists of the management of the money supply and interest rates by the country's central bank. So in this case, Bank of Canada. It's aimed at achieving certain macroeconomic objectives, such as controlling inflation, achieving full employment, or stimulating economic growth. The Bank of Canada plays a very pivotal role in the monetary policy, which is at the behest of governments. The government will say, well, we want to increase or we want to decrease, and the Bank of Canada acts to make that happen. There's really two monetary targets of the Bank of Canada, and they're the money supply and the interest rate. So the Bank of Canada can target either the money supply or the target interest rate, but not both. We call these changes expansionary or contractionary monetary policies. 
In an expansionary monetary policy, it really aims to increase the amount of money in the economy to make credit cheaper and more easily available so that more money will flow and more productivity will happen, more jobs will be created, more product will go out the door, and it will speed up the economy. And that's what's called an easy money policy. And that's really been the case in Canada for prior to COVID quite a number of years. We had really low interest rates, so people bought a lot of stuff and people didn't save a lot. As we've seen interest rates increase after COVID, we're moving into a period of contractionary monetary policy. And effectively what that does is we're trying to limit the amount of money in the economy. Credits become harder to get because interest rates have gone up and more expensive to attain. This is a tight monetary policy and it's designed to slow down the economy. So two tools Bank of Canada can use to increase or decrease money supply is uh, what's called open market operations, which is they're going out and buying and selling treasure bills, short-term bonds effectively, in the market that's open to anyone. So the open market operations can be initiated in short notice, are impactful, and can be done for any amount. So they can suck up money or put money into the system. The other tool that can be used is switching government deposits, so transferring deposits to and from the Bank of Canada to the commercial banks. And this is getting increasingly popular, so if the Bank of Canada lends money out to the banks, the banks then can lend it out to the public. So we can see open market operations demonstrated in this little graphic here. we got the Bank of Canada, and we got the private corporations or banks over there. So uh, the Bank of Canada will buy T-bills from private corporations, write a check that, that creates a flow. So the Bank of Canada buys T-bills from the corporation, pays with a check, and effectively the check is deposited into commercial banks. That puts money into the commercial banks, which increases their reserves and effectively allows them, as we've seen with the multiplier, to increase uh, the amount of money in supply. So we've seen the Bank of Canada has these two major tools in which it can go and affect the money supply. As of late, they have tended to stay away from open market operations. Because, first of all, in targeting the money supply, they can't directly affect what private banks do. So they, the private banks could still go out and loan money. So they have very little control over how much money gets loaned out. Secondly, they can't know for certain that demand for money is what it is. Secondly, they don't know for certain what the demand for money is, and they can't predict with certainty what effect a given change in the money supply will have on that. So targeting the interest rate is the key tool that's used by the Bank of Canada. And really, a drop in the bank rate signals expansionary policy, and a rise in the interest rate signals a contractionary policy. It's as simple as that. So what impact do changes expansionary or contractionary have? How does that flow into the economy? Well, that's really what we call the monetary transmission process. And the transmission process is nothing more than the way that a change in interest rates affects the money supply to real variables in the economy through the interest rate. The interest rate provides a link between the money market and the actual product market. Again, expansionary monetary policies where interest rates are lower, increases the money supply, lowers the interest rates, and it leads to an increase in investment, and therefore aggregate expenditures will go up and drive demand. The result is a multiplied effect on real GDP and higher price level. The result is, as we've seen, when you free up money to be loaned, this creates a multiplier effect and it will affect real GDP and create a higher price level. A contractionary monetary policy, on the other hand, will decrease the money supply, which increases the interest rate and leads to a decrease in investment, and therefore aggregate expenditures will tend to drop. And the result, multiplying impact of the real GDP and lower price level will be the effect of this. We'll end up with a... So the multiplier effect comes in here in reverse, and it will slow down the economy. A contractionary policy could also be likened to what's called an anti-inflationary monetary policy. And effectively, what that does is it drives interest rates up in order to cut inflation. Because inflation erodes our spending power. And effectively, anti-inflationary monetary policies help preserve internal and external values of the currency. 
through several means. First of all, it keeps inflation rates low, and second of all, it keeps exchange rates stable, which are very important seeing we're such a big trading nation. There's lots of criticisms to anti-inflationary monetary policy. The very fact that you're slowing down the economy means you, we're going to have lower economic growth, higher unemployment, and big budget deficits. And the opposition parties often target government for those ills or the negative effects of anti-inflationary monetary policy. Those are really the key issues in the chapter that I want you to focus on. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks.